from one islander to another, Isle of Wight Radio proudly presents John Hannam Meets. Welcome to another John Hannam Meets. Over the years, I've had some legendary actors on this show, including Charlton Heston, John Mills, Jeremy Irons, Richard Todd, Sheila Hancock, Sylvia Sims, and today, another of my favourites, the wonderful Peter Bowles. Nice to be at your house, Peter. Thank you, John. I've watched you over the years and been enthralled by your career, and it's a real pleasure to come and talk to you. Thank you, John. Very nice to meet you. Currently, as we speak, you're at the Phoenix Theatre in The Exorcist. Yes. Which I saw a, few, a month or two ago, and I enjoyed it. Good. It's the first proper West End theatre I appeared in, in 1961, and I've never been in it since, and it'll be probably the last theatre, because I think I'm 81 now, and I think perhaps um, my wife's got fed up with me going out every night. <laughs> At least she knows where I am. Yes, exactly. <laughs> and you've got a new movie called uh, Together, I think, haven't yes, you? Yes, yes, which I did with Sylvia Sims yes, last and year. An indie, yeah, an indie movie, yeah. It's about a care home, isn't it? Yes, it'll be the second film I've done about a care home because I did one with Ben Wishaw called Lilting, uh, which did come out and uh, did well on uh, the Curzon circuit, yeah. Right, so I'm intrigued because... Originally, you thought about being a doctor and perhaps being a dentist. <laughs> Would you have been a good doctor or a good dentist, do you think, or not? I don't know. I can't answer that. <laughs> I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> I know Dad worked to the stately home, which was... Uh, he was a chauffeur, was he, and a, and a butler? <clears throat> My father was both a, a, a butler and, and a, a chauffeur to two different families. Funnily enough, I see that um, the Beaverbrook... Lord Breverbrook's country house is now a hotel and uh, it's just opened and I have a photograph of my mother sitting outside it and I thought of going down there and sitting in the same place. My mother used to tell me she was a nanny to um, Lord Breverbrook's daughter who was the Duchess of Argyle at the time. She used to tell me that that Lord Breverbrook used to come up into her room, into her bedroom and sit on her bed and chat to her before... He took to his own quarters. That wouldn't go down well today, would it? No. <laughs> <laughs> so that was like a real Downton Abbey then, was it, in a way, I suppose? Yes, yes. Is it true an old pupil of your school won a prize at RADA? Did that sort of inspire you in the early days, really? Well, it more than inspired me. It made me realise that, um, that there was some way of becoming a professional actor. Because I had no idea. I mean, the family that I was brought up with, we didn't go to the theatre. I knew nothing really about the theatre, except I did a lot of amateur work and school plays. And uh, the fact that it was announced at school assembly, I'd managed to get into a grammar school, (laughs) and um, that this pupil had won a top prize at the Royal Academy of Dramatic Art was the first time I'd ever heard of a place where you could go to learn about uh, acting or so on. So then I wrote to them and um, anyway I won a scholarship and so my parents could afford. Originally you sort of only had one term then? Well I did. I got in and my parents could only afford one term. It was about 23 guineas. It was 23 guineas. Wow. But there was a prize to be won for the best student and in those days they used to take in 120 students in the first term and then that's the way they made their money and then keep getting rid of them until the last term, there'd be 23 left, uh, do you see, after yes. two years. Yes. Uh, and uh, I won the prize, uh, amazingly, which meant I got a scholarship. It also meant I could get a major award uh, from my council, who wouldn't give me one before, because I'd never taken A-levels. I was too young. I think you were impressed by the young ladies there. Is that a fact or not? Uh, well, no, it's very much a fact. I'd never <laughs> seen, I'd only seen women like that in my mother's woman's own and that type of thing. Uh, They look like uh, mannequins to me. I know you went to elocution fairly early, I suppose, did you? I I, I did go to elocution, and uh, also going to those elocutions was um, Alan Bates, so that was interesting. And uh, he was always met after the elocution lessons by John Dexter, who went on to become a massive director. I liked Alan very much, and he was at RADA when I was at RADA. 
You also, early on in your career, you shared a flat with Albert Finney, didn't you? I did, for about a year, but just a tiny flat. I, did. I bet that was fun, wasn't it? Yes, I loved him very much. I still love him. Yes, mm. wonderful. You were also a movie extra for a little while. You, you did odd sort of extra well, roles, didn't you? Well, that was when I was at RADA in order to earn some money. When we had our little breaks, holidays, in between terms, I should say. Yes, I, I'm not under my name. I, I made up a name. And I did do quite a few films as an extra. I love the story when you went, I think it was a, a holiday at Christmas, you went to work. Um, was it the Nottingham Post Office or something? Y- yes, I did. <laughs> Didn't uh, they sack you or something? Uh, they did. They <laughs> sacked me after about three days. And um, I said, why? And they said, the, the men won't work with you because you talk too posh. <laughs> so I'd been at RADA for about a year then, and I'd obviously lost most of my Nottingham accent. And uh, they wouldn't work with me because I talk too posh. You and I have a, a great love for the sort of original days of rock and roll. I know you, yes. you actually yes. saw Presley when you were in America, didn't you? Well, I saw him on television, mm. yes. Um, I did. Um, I saw his first Ed Sullivan show, I think. It was wonderful. I also saw the very last performance of Eddie Cochran. Did you? Yes, in Bristol. Wow, yes, yeah. it was that night when yeah. he had the car crash. Yes, I did. Golly. And I, I discovered later on uh, that uh, Joe Brown was in that show as well. Yes, I'd, he was. I made a film with Joe Brown, one of the first pictures I ever made, I, I did with Joe Brown, who's still rocking. Terrific. Yeah. As we speak, I'm seeing him this coming Saturday. He's coming to the Isle of Wight. But I met Joe him, Brown is? Yeah, I yes. met him about a month ago in London because I've interviewed him numerous times, you know. Oh, right. I liked him very much. He's yeah. a lovely chap. You talked about Ed Sullivan. You remember Arthur Worsley, the ventriloquist? Yes, I do. Well, I got to know Arthur quite well, and one day, casually, he said to me, Oh, John, did I ever tell you I was on the Ed Sullivan show with Elvis Presley? I said, wow. no. And uh, I think it, that possibly was one of the first times Presley oh. was on. Yes, Amazing, so I don't remember it? that. Actually, uh, Ronnie Rinald. Yes. Now, this thought hasn't been in my mind for a hell of a long time. I must have wanted to somehow become known because I can remember... And I must have been no more than three or four, because I know where I was living when I was doing this. I used to whistle, and I kept thinking, perhaps somebody from the radio will hear me, and I'll get onto the radio and whistle on the radio, you know? Yes. It's extraordinary. He was a megastar, wasn't he? He was. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, so obviously my ambitions were nothing to do with being a dentist or a doctor. I just hadn't been recognised as a whistler. <laughs> no. I love your stories. You went into the craze bar on one occasion, didn't you? I did. Yes. Yes. <laughs> uh, yes. I'd, I'd gone for a drink and I met this beautiful young woman. And I just bought a coat and uh, we had a couple of drinks together. She's a very attractive young woman. And then she said, do you know of an afternoon drinking club? And I said, uh, no, I, I didn't. I was too young. And she said, well, I know of one. And uh, she said where it was. I said, well, I don't have enough money for the tax. She said, don't worry about that. I've got plenty of money. So anyway, this is a long story, so I'm going to cut it very short. All right. She took me to uh, a place called Esmeralda's Barn, and she just ordered a drink. I thought we were the only people in there. And then I saw some men beckoning to me and um, I went down to speak to them. And uh, I'm really shortening this story because it's uh, (laughs) quite a dramatic story. So I'll shorten it very much. They told me um, to F off because that was Reggie's girlfriend and he was about to arrive. (laughs) And uh, I asked if I could take my coat or say goodbye. And they said, I thought you understood English. F off. So you went? I did. And, I, and I, thank God my uh, front door keys weren't in the coat. So anyway, yeah. I also love the story when you started to grow a tail. Is that a fact? Yes, that's right. I, I was in pantomime in at Nottingham Rep uh, playing the wolf in Red Riding Hood. And I, I had a contraption which was belted onto me, to my wolf suit, and the tail protruded... It was a wire thing covered in some sort of fur. And uh, it 
rubbed against the bottom of my spine, I suppose, during the play, and I started to get a lump there, about the size of a walnut, eventually. And um, I went to my doctor, he said, I don't know what that is, I'll send you to a specialist. Um, I don't know what specialist who looks at lumps at the bottom of your spine are called, but anyway, I went there, and he said, drop your trousers uh, and bend over, uh, which I did, and he started to laugh. He said, my God, he said, I haven't seen anything like that since I was at El Alamein. <laughs> oh, gosh. He said, uh, you've got Jeep Bottom. And uh, he said, people forget that we're very closely related to the apes uh, and monkeys, and the tail is still there. If it's activated, it will grow, and you are, you've activated it by the tail you're wearing, as I told him I was doing this better way. And he said, I I'm going to lance it, and you will see that it's hair. You're growing your own tail. So, yes. Early TVs, I know you did things like Danger Man and Troubleshooters, No Hiding Place, Emergency yes. World 10. Yes. Um, when you did Magnolia Street, which was very early, I think they were going to pay you about nine guineas, but you managed to get a bit more, didn't you? Yes, I got 12 guineas for... Uh, the interesting thing about Magnolia Street, which is one of the very first televisions I did, was it was about a Jewish family. And there was a number of ladies in it, and they asked me to have tea with them, which was very nice. And they said, we want to talk to you because we want to know why and help you, if we can, why you're denying you're a Jew. I said, I don't understand. Well, they said, you're denying your Jewishness. I said, but I, I'm not Jewish. They said, that's what we mean. I said, I'm sorry, I don't quite understand. In fact, what they were doing, without realising it, were they were paying me an enormous compliment. I was playing a young Jewish boy, and they were convinced <laughs> that I was Jewish and that I wasn't admitting it. That's and what... they were quite cross, and well, they would they... not accept, they would not accept that I wasn't Jewish. Wow. So that that was extraordinary. A lovely compliment then, wasn't it? And Obviously. 12 guineas a show. Yes. <laughs> to boot. Yes. <laughs> Just before your first screen test, Yes. I think you were sort of called in for the birth of a baby, weren't you? Yes, my first, yes, that's right. I had a screen test uh, on the probably the Monday morning or whatever time it was to be at the studios Pinewood at half past seven. And in the middle of the night, my wife started to... Uh, to know that she was going to give birth. So I called for an ambulance. I don't know whether we even had a phone, but I know we went by ambulance to the Charing Cross Hospital, and because they were very short-staffed there, I had to assist in the delivery of my son. Uh, it was quite dramatic, because it turned out to be the doctor's first ever delivery. And if it hadn't been for a, a very powerful and authoritative midwife... There could have been trouble. But anyway, so my son was born, actually born at half past eight, but I knew I had this film test. Uh, so after a lot of kissing and being very happy and thrilled, I got a cab to Pinewood, and uh, I arrived there, I suppose, about half past nine, ten o'clock or something. And uh, I thought uh, they'd be very pleased to see me and give me a cigar, but they were rather cross, <laughs> because I'd kept a whole studio waiting. Oh. Um, and um, anyway, I got the job. For one screen test, you dressed up, didn't you? Pinstripe suit? That, that is indeed uh, true. I was going to play an East End gangster. And this has been my character all my life. I will not be dictated to by anybody, unless it's a dictator. And then, of course, I'd be shot, I suppose. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I, I went for a costume fitting, and the costume designer said, oh, yes, you're playing a gangster, so you'll wear a, a black shirt and a white tie. And I said, no, no, I won't. She said, what do you mean? And I said, this is what came out of my head, because I hadn't given it a thought particularly. I said, I'll wear a pinstripe suit, three-piece uh, and a tie, and a bowler hat, and I'll carry an umbrella. And uh, she said, but that's ridiculous. I said, well, that's it. That's what I want. 
And she said, I don't know what the director would say. Anyway, when I did get changed and then went on for the film test, I did in fact have this, and the director was absolutely amazed and thrilled, and they used that image of me for the poster for the film, yeah. Going back to the baby, you'd be very at home in Call the Midwife, wouldn't you, the Sunday night oh, I TV see. series? Yes, I would, yes, yes. that's true. <laughs> I like that show, it's very good. So do I. You work with some biggies, obviously... I loved a story when you were in a movie called The Offence, I think, with, with Sean Connery. He kept making you laugh, or you made him laugh. I made him laugh? <laughs> yes. He kept falling on the floor. I mean, literally falling on the floor. Sidney Lumet used to get quite cross about it. <laughs> but he was uh, very charismatic. We were talking before we recorded this about some great charismatic yes, actors. Yes, he and... was. He was very masculine. The strange thing, well, it's not strange, but this is a fact of life, I knew about Sean Connery long before anybody else because I had always been a student of bodybuilding and I used to buy a bodybuilding magazines and um, he was junior Mr Scotland on the front cover of one of them, which I've still got. And I knew Sean, I'd met him. Amazingly, one of my aunts, my mother, was the eldest of four daughters, but she was the eldest, this was the youngest, who was only four years older than me. She'd been out with Sean Connery when she was Miss Scotland. Really? Yeah. And I think he was junior Mr Scotland, you see. I knew Sean, and I had supper with him on the evening of the day that he'd been offered Bond. James Bond. What I didn't say to him when he told me about how he'd been offered it, what I didn't say to him was that I'd been working that very day with Patrick McGowan, who turned it down and told me why he <laughs> turned it down. But I, I, didn't, uh, I wasn't stupid enough to say it. That's a Sean at the time. You were making a movie at Faradin House, which is in Oxford, I think, isn't it? Yes, with Richard yes. Burton. <laughs> uh, yes. Did he leave a bit early or something? Yes. I did a film called um, Laughter in the Dark, a Tony Richardson film by Nabalkov. It's a wonderful script. Uh, and Richard Burton was the star of it, and Elizabeth Taylor was there as well. I always remember Elizabeth coming onto the set and everybody clapping her, you know, like royalty, which she was. But, yes, uh, Richard got fired. I could go into the details <laughs> of it, but, again, I know this isn't a long interview, and uh, most of these things you asked me about, I wish I could tell you about in a very, very entertaining way, hopefully, are quite long. Yes. But he did get um, uh, fired, and uh, Nicol Williamson took over. Really? Mm. You did a pilot for Callan, an early one. It was like in an armchair theatre, wasn't it? It was. Yeah. It was called Magnum for Schneider. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I played Mears. It was very successful, armchair theatre. And they decided to make a series called Callan, and I was contracted to play Mears, and uh, we hadn't started or anything, but I'd signed the contract. And, but then I got this wonderful part in the Charge of the Light Brigade film, which was shot for five months in Turkey. And I uh, asked them if I could get out of the contract, and uh, they let me off, thank goodness. I think they did say, you'll never work with us again if you do. That didn't deter me. Because <laughs> um, I did, I did work with them many times again. Yes, I think you did about six different armchair theatres because it was so popular at the, yes. the period, wasn't it? Really? Yes, I did. Obviously, to the man born, so many got to know you. And when you look back, Peter, um, yes. one in three of the nation watched that on a Sunday night. That yeah. could never happen anymore, could it? No, and they didn't record it either. They watched it. They sat and watched it. Yes. Yeah, I know. And a show off here. Yeah, go on. When, when they decided to do a silver wedding anniversary of it, it came out for a Christmas special with the new Doctor Who, David Tennant or someone like that, and which they'd advertised all over the cinemas. They'd spent a fortune on it, and they put out this to the man of born, <laughs> and we only missed becoming the number one by a few hundred we were number two with 11,600,000 or something. And, and Doctor Who won with sort of 11,850,000. Eventually about 20 million watch you every Sunday, which is, looking back, it's incredible. Yes, it? they did. Never less than 20 million. I think the top was 24 million. Was it? 
Mm. And of course, at that time, only when I laugh was also being seen, was it? So you had two hit series. I did. Yeah. They were both. They were both number one <laughs> in the weeks that they were shown. You must have thought I've made it now. <laughs> well, I, I don't know what to think. I knew that I wasn't being paid any money. It's, <laughs> it's very little money you were paid in those days. But um, what it did for me was that I'd always had thoughts and ideas for projects and things, and I could never speak to anybody. They would never answer the phone call or whatever. But um, once I'd been in those enormous hits, I was hot, and so I was able to ring anybody, and they would answer the phone once they knew it was me. And so um, that changed my life. The Irish RM, the resident magistrate, that was sort of your idea, wasn't it, really? Well, that particular one wasn't so much my idea, but I was very connected with it in that I was offered it years before I did it by a man called Ronald Inkpen and uh, read all the books and thought, why aren't they offering this to Michael Caine? Why, why are they offering it to little old me? This is in 1975, I think. And uh, he, unfortunately, had a brain hemorrhage when he was on his way to America to get some extra money. And I then tried to acquire the rights. I couldn't manage it. And uh, then, amazingly... I went to the cinema with my wife. Not that part's amazing, but when we came out, because the cinema's just up the road, uh, instead of coming home, we went to a, a restaurant which we'd never been to before, and a young lady who I'd met with David Hemmings stopped by the t table int and introduced me to her fiancé, and he said that he was going to do a film television series about the Irish RM, and I said, have you cast the major? And he said... Do you know the books then? I said, yes, I do. He said, you, well, you're the only actor I've come across who does. I said, have you cast it? He said, I'm just about to cast it. I said, well, I'd like to play it. He said, I'll contact your agent tomorrow. Major Yates, wasn't it? Yeah. Yes. You'd done The Bounder as well, of course. That was... Had... George Cole was in that. Were yeah. you an ex-convict in that? You were, weren't you? Yes, that's yes. right. Yeah. He was a con man, yes. Yes. One of my real all-time favourites was Lytton's Diary, which was about a newspaper world, wasn't it, really? Yes. That was a huge success for you, wasn't it? Yes, what happened about that was I'd been wanting to set up a series about a gossip columnist, but nobody didn't want to know, wouldn't speak to me. Then I did To the Manor Born, and the head of BBC drama called me aside at some point at the BBC and said, you realise what you've done, don't you? I said, what? He said, you've joined the other side. I said, I'm sorry, I don't know what you mean. He said, well, you've gone into light entertainment. You, you will never work in drama again. You've joined the other side. <laughs> and I discovered that people who worked in sitcom then, this is before Judy Dench did it, no director who did drama ever directed sitcom and nobody who directed sitcom ever did drama. And there was a huge prejudice against it. And I was so cross... I was really very cross. I went home and uh, I wrote a whole thing about a series, a whole format and, uh, and storylines, and I rang up. I got hold of the telephone number of the head of Thames Television Drama. I rang him at home and I said, I have the best idea for a television series you've ever heard. Now, I was hot. I was mm. hot. I pulled in the biggest figures with Penny Keith that's ever been on television at that time. And he said, well, if it's that good, you'd better come over to my house tomorrow morning at half past seven <laughs> right. and pitch it to me over breakfast. And by the time I got back home at nine o'clock, he rang up and said, 13 one hours. Wow. Yeah, and that's how it started. <laughs> then Perfect Scoundrels. <laughs> you had so that many was big series. series yes. Yeah. Too common. That was my idea, too. Was it? Oh, absolutely, yes. Yes. What I did with that was I wrote to Greg Dyke. I just wrote him a letter and... and outlined the idea for it and said, I think this will make a good series. I didn't know Greg Dyke, but I knew he was the head of Southern Television. And he wrote back by return of post and said, I think it's a wonderful idea. I'll get the head of drama. And within a week, we were discussing writers. And Brian Murray was in that one as well, wasn't he? Oh, very he? much so, yes, yeah. indeed he was, yes. Because you two together were... Well, the thing, the thing about it, when we did the Irish RM, I came up with this idea and discussed it with Brian about doing this con man, like the, the sort of the lizard and the leprechaun type of thing. And we tried to pitch it to the man who uh, had produced the Irish RM, who 
still owes me a fortune. And he, he wasn't interested, and I'd forgotten about it. And years went by, and then Brian came round to my house and said, that's the idea for a series you had. Why don't we pitch it again? So, you know, it's very much down to him coming around to my house that, that wow. day. Wow. Coming up to date, of course, Duke yeah. of Wellington in Victoria, which was a, another massive series. Yeah. Well, I am doing Wellington yes. in Victoria. Yeah. Yes, I am. Yes. Lovely series, isn't it? It is, yes, and lovely people too. Everybody involved in it, the, the producers, Mammoth Screen and all that, are the, some of the most professional, nice, polite people I've ever worked with. You know, they treat actors so well. Peter, obviously, you've been around, you've done it. In that particular series with Victoria, there's some fantastic young people, aren't there? I bet you're impressed with them, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> yes, of course I am. I'm, I, I'm impressed, too, uh, with their beauty, too. They're so handsome and good-looking, as well as their talent. I mean, one is surrounded by handsome people. <laughs> and one is tottering about thinking, oh, God, I wish I was 50 years younger. In your wonderful autobiography, there's some stunning pictures of you as a young guy. <laughs> oh, that's nice. There we go. <laughs> you've done lots of West End plays. I know yes, you I did have. The Entertainer in the West End, yeah, didn't you? Yes. And um, you've done a lot with Sir Peter Hall, haven't you? I have. I've done 12 plays wow. for Sir Peter Hall. And I've, I was counting them up. I think I've done about 24 plays in the West End. Amazing, oh, golly. isn't it? Yeah. yeah. And it all started with that old Vic company back in, what, 56, like, I 1956. suppose? 1956. Yeah. Yeah, six months. In fact, my first television was a colour television, and I think it was live colour television in, in America of Romeo and Juliet, where I played uh, Abraham, the servant, you know, a few, few lines. But that was in 1956, and I thought then... My God, if we ever get colour television in England, people won't go to the cinema at all. That was amazing. Because when I started television, ITV hadn't really started. And I did quite a few live televisions. Mm. And I did a famously and tragically a live television where one of the leading men died during the transmission, a thing called Underground. And uh, it was about the bomb having hit London and a group of people you know, who had survived it, but they were in the underground and uh, there was rubble everywhere. It's live. Verity Lambert was the assistant to the director who went on to direct many films. I can't remember his name just for the moment. And uh, this a very fine actor was playing, funnily enough, someone with heart trouble and was taking pills and uh, he dropped dead. But they carried on. We saw him coming towards us and as he was coming towards us, he fell over and we were told he'd twisted his ankle or something and we said well if so-and-so were here I'm sure he would say and we, we made it up and they broke for a television commercial and this is interesting the television commercials were done in the studio with actors you know with the tin of dog meat or whatever it was and they'd have the dog meat there and they'd speak suddenly while we were trying to work out you know what was going on when you were 60, you met a guy from the Times. You'd written your obituary, hadn't he? <laughs> yes, he was standing next to me in the stalls of a public lavatory. <laughs> uh, and he said, my God, it's Peter Bowles. I said, that's right. He said, well, I've just written your obituary. I write the obituary for the Times, and you're 60 today, aren't you? And I said, yes, I am. <laughs> there was another occasion when you must have felt acting was worthwhile. You got clapped into Heathrow... I did. Airport, didn't you? Yes, that was extraordinary. That was a tingly moment, I bet, wasn't it? It was. It was. Very much so. Going on this particular trip, which was going to America to publicise the Irish RM, I had been put into the VVVIP room. I was met at the airport and put into this room, which was a tiny room full of boxes and four people. And the four people in there were ABBA. Uh, there was Sue and I and Abba, and we had a good time together. And then I went to America, and, uh, and then when I came back, as I came out of customs or whatever they call it, there's all these people waiting to meet uh, and greet their relatives or friends, and they saw me, and there was this tremendous applause, and I had no idea it was for me for a moment. Of course, it didn't occur to me for one second. That's one of the greatest thrills of my life. Another great thrill must have been when you found out Marlon Brando was a fan. Yes, it was, and the great regret is that uh, he wanted to have me to lunch, and uh, my agents never told me. 
Oh. It's a terrible. The other ridiculous thing is that Quentin Tarantino asked me to have dinner with him, and um, I turned him down. <laughs> so I, I, you know, very odd business. Many years ago, a new pop group came to the Isle of Wight, and I'd never heard of them. No one had heard of them. They came to film a video, mm. and I was offered an interview, and a bit like you, I turned it down. <laughs> Take that. <laughs> Oh, yes. <laughs> were you offered Paul Eddington's part in The Good Life? Was I was, that a yes. Do you regret that or not? No, really? not at all. No. If I'd have done that, I would never have become a leading actor. I would have continued to be a character actor, but I would never have got to The Man of Born, obviously. I wouldn't have got that. And because I got that, I was able, to, for the first time, really, to open my shoulders and play off my own persona and that made me into a star leading actor do you want to tell me about princess margaret or oh, it's in your book isn't it <laughs> a couple of meetings with her wasn't it oh yes yes i was in a in a lineup uh, and princess margaret is coming down my wife is with me who you've met sue and um she saw me and uh, there was immediate twinkle in her eye <laughs> and anyway when she got to me she's with an equerry we're all dressed up in dinner jackets, I think. She had a cigarette in a, in a cigarette holder, and she said to me, give me a light, and then turned away to speak to her equerry. And I had some book matches, funnily enough. And she turned then, with the cigarette in her cigarette holder, towards me, and I struck the match, and she said, oh, my God, sulphur! <laughs> Haven't you got a lighter? And to my amazement, certainly to her amazement, my wife stepped in front of me, so her face is inches from Princess Margaret's, and said, how dare you speak to my husband like that? You're a very rude woman. And uh, it was like an H.E. Bateman cartoon. <laughs> but uh, Princess Margaret handled it wonderfully and apologised to my wife and said, you're quite right. I didn't mean to be rude, but I can't stand sulphur. And it, the whole thing was handled wonderfully well. But then... About two years later, I was at a private party, and Princess Margaret happened to be there. And she came up to me and said, Good evening, Mr. Bowles. I said, Good evening, ma'am. And she gave me a clutch bag and said, You are my bag man for the evening, and walked away. <laughs> so, you know, I followed her with this clutch bag. And then she said, In that bag are my cigarettes and a lighter. I would now like a cigarette. <laughs> and uh, so I gave her a cigarette and lit it with the lighter. And then she said, thank you. Can I have my bag now? And I gave her the bag. And she said, touche, I think, Mr Bowles. <laughs> so I thought it was charming. Peter, congratulations on a fantastic career. You, you've you. had so much success and, and you've enthralled millions of people, which is a great credit to you. And oh, that. and the writers. Let us not forget the writers. No. Couldn't have done any of enthralling without the writers. <laughs> Currently, as we said earlier, in The Exorcist, and you obviously you've worked with for Bill Kenwright over the years, haven't you? I have. I've done quite a few plays for Bill. Yes. I like Bill very much. We get on very well together. So, um, as you said, you're 81. Not ambitious or still ambitious, really? Uh, well, I like to work. Thanks to Sir Peter Hall, uh, who took me up. But then he took me up because I'd taken an idea I had to the BBC for a film and pitched it to them. And they said, I, that's wonderful. And they said, here's a million pounds. Uh, go and make the film. So we made the film, and Peter Hall saw it, went out on a Sunday night, and uh, then said, happened to meet him in the street on the Monday after he'd gone out on the Sunday. And uh, I'd never met him before. And he said, I'd very much like to work with you. And I said, I've been trying to work with you for the last 40 years. And I did 12 plays with him. But very early on, he raised the bar. I didn't take a lot of convincing that I was much better than I realised I thought I was good, obviously. Mm. <laughs> um, but he was able to convince me that I could go higher, and that made a huge difference, a huge difference. My late wife uh, was a great fan of Peter Bowles, and I know she would have loved to have been here today, but well, you're one of those actors, Peter, that if you're in it, I watch it, because I know you, you don't do rubbish, do you? <laughs> No, I don't, no. I try not to do rubbish, no. <laughs> well, you've been in, as we've said today, you've been in so many big hit series. You played four different villains in The Avengers, didn't you? I did, yeah. yes. Amazing story when you look back. 
Emergency Ward 10. That yeah. was an early thing for you. That yes, was only... Albert Finney did one of those, you know. Yeah. And in the one I did, Robert Morley was in it. Was he? Mm. Last question, in a way. Some of the great actors that you've worked with, anyone that really stands out that you've worked with, that you've looked back and think, gosh, I'm glad I worked with them. Is there... I'll tell you something which has been a comfort to me. John Mills, when I was doing um, Perfect Scoundrel, came in and did one day. He arrived in a chauffeur-driven Rolls Royce beautifully dressed. He did one day and the one day was a big scene with me. He was 80, I think, and uh, still looked wonderful. I mean, I was thrilled to meet him. He was a great actor. Great. Don't say that lightly. A mm. great screen actor. And after we'd done the scene, he said, was I any good to me? I said, Sir John, you were wonderful as always. Mm. It's a thrill for me to be working with you. He said, oh, it's very kind of you. I, the reason I ask, I've been out of work for two years, everybody thinks I'm dead. It's the first offer of a job I've had. And now I'm 81 myself. I, I, <laughs> you, I, you know I, the feeling. I know the feeling, <laughs> yes. I went to a sales at Denham Village and, and when he came into the room and, and spoke, it was a tingly moment for me because I'd watched him for years, you know. Yeah. No swank, no ego, nothing, just a lovely man. Mm. So... Great buzz to come and talk to you, and I wish your career continued success and another series of Victoria in the pipeline, hopefully. Yes, or... yes, there certainly is, yeah. Good. I, I know that. And thanks for your hospitality. The next thing, thank you. The next thing I'm going to do, in fact, uh, the BBC, uh, well, I suppose it's the BBC, it's the BBC Big Band. Uh, it is going to be 100 years uh, since the ending of the First World War, and they're doing a magnificently written uh, and got together thing of all the songs and the poetry and everything that came out of that first world war and the music being played by the BBC big band and um, I'm hosting some of the shows the Barbican is one of them and I'm hosting it they're doing Churchill's speeches and everything you know so that's the next thing I know what I'm doing Lovely to meet you and uh, very much for your time. Very nice to meet you, John. Thank you. Well, that was super smashing great, wasn't it? Jim Bowen here, just reminding you, you've been listening to John Hannum on Isle of Wight Radio. Keep looking on the Isle of Wight Radio website, the John Hannum website and YouTube for more John Hannum Meets new interviews. Bye-bye for now. Isle of Wight Radio.